What is going on, gum fighters? Welcome to Gum Fighter Life, the podcast where we talk about gum fighting with God at the center and real world first hand experience. Today, we're going to talk about having standards and how that pertains to gun fighting and being a warrior, a strong man of God. Before the bio, I just want to say thanks for listening. I am humbled and blessed to be a shepherd in this community. If you're a listener, I may not know you personally. If you're a patron, I do believe I've gotten to know those men rather well. And the caliber of men that those are make me humbled to be a part of this. Anyway, I usually say thanks for listening at the end, but I want to say thanks for listening at the beginning of this. With that, I'll plug in the bio. If you want to skip it, go ahead, skip around 3 minutes and 45 seconds. Who am I? A question we should all ask ourselves. I am, first and foremost, a servant of God made in his very own image. A follower of of Jesus Christ. A simple man called by God to the Great Commission to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Next, a little bit about my background and what God has allowed me to do and blessed me to do in life. Grew up what most would consider very poor in the backwoods of the southeastern and mid-Atlantic United States, hunting and fishing. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. So a decorated Marine Corps combat veteran. Infantry assaultman. After the combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also a veteran of law enforcement. I served with LAPD. I was a sworn peace officer, a cop for LAPD. I worked regular patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. One of those more specialized assignments was warrant service, fugitive recovery. Also had some other law enforcement roles. I am an FBI certified firearms instructor and been certified by another three-letter government agency in a lot of firearms and training things. I've also been a private contractor, worked in the private sector, pertaining to tactics and gunfighting and Protecting America from enemies foreign and domestic. I served as the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters in a large metropolitan area. That was our primary mission, to stop active shooters, which sadly are a thing in America today. I've also been blessed to do quite a bit of competition shooting. Started my first formal competitions even before joining the Marine Corps at 17. I had one more shooting competitions than I can remember. I have competed in all manner of disciplines in shooting. I've been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion, West Coast regional champion. Like I said, been blessed to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I mentioned hunting. I've hunted to put meat on the table starting when I was a child. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide, hunting and slaying all manner of beast. And I don't apologize for that. Humbled to be the host of three podcasts. Simple Man Sermons, Alpha Male Podcast, and Gumfighter Life. Obviously, as things not mentioned, I've been blessed to do many other things. But, again, first and foremost, I'm a servant. A servant of God, a believer and follower of the Bible, the Word, Jesus Christ. And I don't apologize for that. With that, let's transition into today's topic. 
You shall not have in your bag differing weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So, standards for the gunfighter. I'm going to start with an analogy that's not gunfighting. don't often use movie quotes, but if you remember a movie called Dodgeball, stick with me, this is going somewhere. Funny movie, kind of ridiculous. I mean, it is a comedy after all. I don't remember the exact dialogue. It's been a long time since I've had a TV or watch movies with any amount of regularity. However, I remember the scene, and again, I don't remember the dialogue, but the owner of the gym walks up to this guy who's working out, and he says, what are you doing today? And the guy says something like, a little of this, a little of that. And he says, oh, keep the body guessing. That's not actually how you work out. That's why that's funny. If you're going to work out today, you should probably have a plan. When you go to the gym, you don't just show up and just do whatever, right? You don't just show up to the gym and be like, oh, I'm going to run for a little bit. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You have a plan. Like a quintessential one is, you know, today is back and biceps, and I'm going to rest, and then it's going to be chest and triceps, and then maybe I'll do legs and abs, and I'll rotate through that. Anyway, that's a pretty classic example of a workout routine. You have a plan. There's a period where you want to stress that muscle specifically or that muscle group specifically, and you want to let it rest. You want to tear that muscle apart and let it rebuild bigger and stronger. That's how that works. You have a plan. You have a standard also, probably. You might say, oh, you know, I'm going to do three sets of 10. That's quintessential. Three sets of 10 of bench press. Did X amount last time. I would like to do better than that this time. Anyway, military, police, they all have standards, right? And that's for a reason. I submit to you, if you consider yourself a gunfighter, part of a well-regulated arms and militia, outside a more formal organization, you likewise should have a standard. You should have an individual standard for you, which I submit should be better than whatever your group standard is. Do a whole other podcast called the Alpha Male Podcast. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but you should want to be better than the base standard of your organization. Your personal standard should be better if you are indeed an alpha male. Which in my experience as a professional gunfighter, men that don't push themselves to be the best all the time generally don't last too long in that profession. There's not a ton of second place ribbons in gunfighting, right? Anyway, with that, I'll share a little bit about my standard. And I'll start by saying, don't measure your corn in somebody else's bushel. If you don't know about Simple Man Sermons, I do a whole other podcast called Simple Man Sermons. There's a sermon entitled, Don't Measure Your Corn in Somebody Else's Bushel. Whether it's the Christian walk or somebody else's marriage or whatever, don't measure your corn in somebody else's bushel. A real common saying for that in gunfighting or in warrior culture is fight your fight, right? Fight your fight. Anyway, in general, with a handgun, my standard is 10 in a row, standing offhand, which means just standing unsupported. It doesn't mean with my left hand. It means standing unsupported. That's in competition vernacular offhand means standing unsupported, with no brace or rest or anything, but standing unsupported, 50 yards on a head plate. I have a pretty standard, since I live semi-nomadically, I only have pretty much two targets that aren't paper targets that I practice with a lot. Anyway, I call it the head plate. It's about the size of a head. 10 in a row, 50 yards, standing with a pistol, no time limit. And I almost always, unless I'm really pressed for time and I have to like functions test a handgun or work on a certain thing, I will almost always do that before anything else. Why? Because if you can't shoot good slow, you're not going to shoot good fast. I repeat that. If you can't shoot good slow, you're not going to shoot good fast. Anyway, that's my standard. That doesn't have to be your standard. I didn't pop out of my mom's womb with a, you know, a pistol in each hand. Don't measure your corn in somebody else's bushel, but you should have an accuracy standard for you. You should set a standard for yourself. Perhaps for you, and this would be about for a good shooter, a reasonable standard, hit a man-sized target, whether that's a USPSA target or one of the USPSA kind of, or IPSC. 
Or maybe it's just a paper plate. You want to be able to get shoot a paper plate at 25 yards with your handgun five times in a row. Like maybe that's your standard, right? Anyway, whatever your standard is, and you should be trying to improve your standard of accuracy in general until you get to a point probably need to develop other skills. There was a time when my standard was 21 in a row at 50. But I would come back frustrated, and my wife would point out, and rightly so, wise counsel, that I would a lot of times spend my entire practice practicing just that. I would a lot of times be out in the desert with my headlights on because I hadn't made my standard yet trying to make that standard. And that was a great thing, and it, I believe, was beneficial. But it was at the detriment of my other skills because I would it would take so long to make that standard. If I was on 18 and I missed one, I'd have to start over to get 21 in a row at 50 yards, especially on a windy day or something like that. Anyway, I was getting to the point where that standard was so hard I was not practicing my draw, was not practicing my left-handed manipulations, was not practicing my reloads or any of that stuff in live fire. So I thought 10 was more reasonable. I thought that, you know, and this is not exactly how it works in real life, but if I was only 90% good at 50 yards, it would mean I would miss 1 out of 10, so it wouldn't work for the standard. The standard for me at 10 in a row meant that I'd have to be better than 90% consistently. Anyway, that's just a little bit about standards. That's that's an accuracy standard. I would encourage you that whatever standards you have, you should start with an accuracy standard. Next, I would encourage you to start with a speed standard. Again, don't measure your corn in somebody else's bushel. My standard is a draw. I would like to have a silhouette size target, but again, I live semi-nomadically, so I don't. What I have is one of those sealable shoot a bunch of times plastic like bright yellow targets it's about the size of both your fists put together or both of my fists put together your fists may be bigger or smaller than mine anyway i hang that up at a fairly close distance my goal is five in a row without miss and five under 0.8 seconds so like 0 0.81 0 0.83 0 0.80 i hope and my standard is at least one of those needs to be in the 0.7. Now, I may make that faster. Because the last couple of times I've been out, they've all been in the 0.7s or better. So like 0 0.70, 0 0.71, 0 0.77. But from the time the buzzer goes off to hitting that target. Now, for this standard, if I miss, I start over. If I don't miss, if I get a good solid hit, but it's probably only going to be slightly over, I won't start over, but I won't count it. So if I get like a 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, and then a 0.9, but it's a good solid hit, I'll just not count that rep. But if I miss, I start back from one. Again, that's my standard. Your standard may be far different. Uh, a good rule of thumb for most police officers when I was a professional trainer of police officers is expected to get your gun out of the holster and get a hit on target at a, at a close range at 1.5 seconds. Maybe you want to make that your standard. I don't know. That's up to you. But it's important to have standards. It takes an expert to be really good at long-range pistol shooting. It takes an expert to be really fast at, at pistol shooting. It takes a master to know when to blend speed and accuracy, when to hit the gas and when to hit the brakes, knowing when to go faster and when you can go faster, and also even harder knowing when you can't go faster, when you have to slow down, knowing when to not take a shot. I would say that was a professional hunting guide. That's an important skill. You have to know and have the discipline to know when to not take that shot, right? Anyway, I would encourage you to have some kind of standard. So this would be your third standard if we're talking about handgun. And we'll get into other stuff. But I'm starting out with that for a reason. But my other standard is something blending those two. And I, when I was running a certain organization, we had a certain qualification that I won't mention. I'll mention a little bit about kind of what it is without being too specific because I don't know that when I'm allowed to share it or that it would be beneficial to share it. But it's basically shooting with a lot of practical movement involved like shooting moving to the right, shooting moving to the left, facing away from the target, so uprange, turning, drawing, engaging, reloading, engaging. Anyway, things like that will also be generally part of my practice session. But if I only have time or if I'm struggling on the first one, that's all that I'll do. My accuracy standard is not there. I need to work on that before I work on other stuff, right? If you can't shoot good slow, you're not going to shoot good fast. 
Anyway, all that to say, don't worry about my standards. Worry about developing your own standards. But I would suggest for for handgun, having an accuracy standard for yourself. Having a speed standard and then blending in some kind of other balance of that. This doesn't just have to be for handgun concealed carry. Let's talk about probably the other end of the spectrum in the shooting world. Hunting. You should have a standard for hunting. You should have a standard. And I don't mean zeroing your rifle. Zeroing your rifle is one thing. I do not think it is correct or germane to zero your rifle on a bench. You're not going to go out and hunt off a bench. If you hunt in Texas where everything's private land and you pay to play, I'm not putting that down. If that's how you have to hunt or how you want to hunt, then hunt that way. If that's how you put meat on the table, then do it. Now, if you're going to hunt from a blind, from a rest at a given distance, you know the corn feeder is you know 100 yards away, then yeah, by all means, do that. If you're going to spot and stalk or shoot off a pack after you've zeroed your rifle, you should have a standard to zero your rifle, right? After your rifle is zeroed, which I've done a whole other episode on zeroing. But after your rifle is zeroed, let's say the old classic an inch high at 100, which I don't really like, but let's say you zero it at inch high at 100 because it's the classic quintessential way to zero, then have a standard. You know, have a standard. We go back to that real easy thing that most people can get for practice, a paper plate. A standard paper plate. And then perhaps your standard is at 300 yards prone. I need to be getting a good prone, maybe with a sling position and get three hits on that paper plate at 300 yards. That will be a good standard. I want to be able to, from the kneeling, get three hits at 200 yards in that paper plate. And then at 100 yards, I want to be able to stand offhand, unsupported, maybe with a sling, maybe not. I want to be able to get three hits in that paper plate standing at 100 yards. And that's your standard. Now, if you're talking about a you know full-power rifle cartridge, it's like I do a lot of times in practice. You may want to practice with a 22 and just make the distance smaller. An easy way, I was thinking about this morning, that you could do that, especially with ammo costing the way that it does today, costing what it costs out that old Ruger 10 22 right you have if you hunt with the bolt action you have a bolt action 22 that's probably even better but break it out and a soup can or like a can of spinach soda cans in my experience don't work as well because especially at the longer distances that round could just go through and you may not know whether you hit it or not in my experience with like a soup can a spinach can you should be able to get some kind of feedback from that can whether you hit it or not but cut the distances you know but same kind of thing Maybe 75 yards from prone, and I'm talking about laying the can down so you see the circular silver end of the can. Take that spinach can, you lay it down at 75 yards. You want to be able to get three in a row if you're practicing for big game hunting. Three in a row is probably all you're ever going to need, hopefully. Um, But three in a row, again, 75 yards prone, and then 50 yards, three in a row from kneeling, and then 25 yards, three in a row offhand right that's not it's not a super crazy hard standard i think if you can do that and it's important to test it with your go-to hunting rifle you go back with your hunting rifle and change it to two two and two right so blowing through all that ammo but you know two after you've made your standard with the 22 you transition to your hunting rifle which should be as easier easier at 300 yards on that paper plate two hits let's say two hits at 300 yards Prone, two hits at 200 yards from the kneeling, and then two hits standing on that paper plate at 100 yards. That's six rounds. Unless you're shooting a 300 wind mag, which I'm not a fan of for a lot of reasons, because you're probably not going to be out there practicing like that with it. But, you know, for a 6.5 Creedmoor or a 308, that's six rounds. It's not prohibitively expensive, right? You're probably talking 10 bucks, and I think being a good proficient hunter is worth that amount of practice. And a big part of that is you'll know what a good shot feels like. You should get to the point where I said earlier, you know, a good hunter, you know when to not take that shot. And these standards will help you do that. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. A gunnery sergeant told me that in the Marine Corps, and I'm sure he didn't come up with it. It was a saying long before that, but that was the first time that I heard it. I heard that in the Marine Corps, in Iraq. He said, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect.
Sometimes a practice session, if you don't have standards, can do more as a detriment than a benefit. As a professional gunfighter and being in charge of them, I would often run training sessions. And I had a guy, and I knew that he shot a lot. Because I saw him shoot a lot. He was a good shooter, but as far as the team goes and our professionals, he was not at the top of the pack. And I'm not saying this to put him down. I'm saying this to prove the point. He went out and shot a lot, but his shooting wasn't training. If you want plinking to be a hobby like golf to just go out and turn money into noise just for fun, and there's a time and a place to just go out and not have any standard at all and just have fun. But that's not what we're talking about today. If you want to train to be better, you need a standard. This guy would go out and shoot more rounds than probably anybody else on the team, including me. But he wasn't that good of a shooter compared to the rest of us. Compared to an average person, yeah, pretty good. But because he didn't really have a standard, he would just literally go out and spray rounds. And if he missed, it's fine to miss if you're learning something from it. But if you miss and you just dump a bunch more rounds till you hit the target, that doesn't really help you. That doesn't help you get better. Part of this is knowing when you'll be able to hit with a reasonable degree of certainty. And you'll be able to decide whether you're going to take that chance or not. Because nothing is 100% certain, right? We all miss, including me. But you should have a pretty good idea of whether you can hit a target at a given distance or not. And you may decide whether or not it's worth it. Like, Let's say I'm shooting a USPSA competition. There is a target that's partially covered with a hostage target at 25 yards. And I know for me, leaning around that barricade have about an 80% chance of hitting that target and about a 10% chance of hitting the hostage, which is a huge penalty. But the payoff is quite a bit in time. In a competition, right, I might cast that lot. I might, I might take that, that probability. However, if I'm out hunting and I have an 80% probability of hitting a deer, I'm not going to take that shot. I want a much, much higher. And again, nothing is certain, but I'm not just going to shoot a deer I have an 80% chance of hitting it or missing it because then I have an equally high chance probably of wounding it which is not acceptable to me now that changes let's say if I'm in an actual survival scenario and I haven't eaten in three days it's the only deer that I've seen and I have an 80% chance of hitting it yeah I'm probably going to take that shot I don't like it but I also don't like starving so that's just part of this training and those standards will let you know your capabilities and that's an important part of it So we talked about a hunting standard. We talked about, you know, practical handgun standards. Let's talk about group standards, right? You know, the FBI has a standard, the FBI qual. I've done a whole other episode about quals. You may want to go look that one up. I think it's a good idea if you're a concealed carrier, anything like that, to shoot the FBI qual. Not because it's the best qual out there. It's not the worst qual out there. But pretty much everybody knows the FBI. It might behoove you to go and shoot that qual with a witness and you both sign the target and date it and take a picture of it on your smartphone or keep the target. If you ever did get in a civilian shooting, and hopefully you never do, but let's say you get in a shooting at that 7-Eleven at a gas station and you have to go to court. Your witness, whoever you shot with, could be subpoenaed. You could both testify that you shot the FBI qual to the FBI standard. The FBI has a standard for a reason, right? Police departments have a standard for a reason. And I will say that you should try and do better. That shouldn't be your end-all, be-all. You shouldn't be like, ah, I can pass the FBI qual, I'm good now. Because it's not a very hard standard. If you want to start there and you're below that threshold and you say, I want to get to where I can pass that every day, even on a really bad day, then I'd say, great. But don't stop there. Continue to get better if you can. Anyway, police agencies, FBI, realize that they're not gunfighters in general. And this is coming from a police officer. This is coming from an FBI certified firearms instructor. Most, you know, it's the Federal Bureau of what? Not gunfighting. It's not the FBG. It's the FBI. Investigations. They're investigators, not gunfighters. They carry a gun just in case. Police officers, talk to any patrol police officer, the average police officer on patrol. They will tell you that most of their job has nothing to do with a gun. They're mostly documenters, paperwork people, and administrators whether or not they like that that is the case it's them in a given week how much time they spend doing paperwork versus how much time they spend shooting with their department with their agency right now you do get some more specialized roles anyway i'm getting off topic the point is they have that standard that local pd standard that police standard that fbi standard mostly for liability they want their officers to not be a liability with their weapon to the department to realize that when you look at those standards, 
Even so, I think it's a good idea to shoot those standards. Now, when I moved to Arizona, I shot the Arizona State Police qualification, even though I was not Arizona State Police. Getting back to standards and how that relates to you. And we talked about group standards. Let's say that you are in a survival group, a MAG, right? If you're going to be armed in a group of other men, you ought to, for the same reason, be reasonably confident that the guy that you're on a team with is not going to shoot you in the back of the head doing buddy rushes, right? You should have some kind of standard in that group. It's not tactical Ken doll time where you get all dressed up in your cool kit. You should have a shooting standard. And if that person can't make that standard, then they shouldn't be allowed to be armed as part of your group. Now, sec, you know, Second Amendment applies. They can be armed however they want, but to be part of your group, part of your security team, whatever you call it, they should be able to meet this standard. And if they don't, then they shouldn't be on it for the same reasons that police departments do that, right? But you should have a standard. Let's say you have a mutual assistance group, right? That's a new hot buzzword. You should have a set standard or qualification. Maybe you want to use the FBI qual because it's there and it's easy and it's a known standard. Maybe you want to use that for handgun and you want to use the U.S. Army rifle qual, right? A 25 meter paper version with reduced targets. Maybe you want to make that your rifle qual and you want to make the FBI qual your handgun qual. That's a start. You may want to add stuff onto that, but maybe... And again, standards are not the only training you should ever do. That's not the only training I ever do. I was outside last night because it's getting colder and darker training with a heavier coat and flashlight doing my dry fire practice. But that's not part of my standard. But your group should have a standard. If it's a mutual assistance group, if it's a mag, a survivalist group, whatever you want to call it, should have a standard, right? If you are on a church security team or running a church security team, you should have a standard. And this is part of what I miss about you know, being living semi-nomadic and trying to get the podcast to be sufficient for... But anyway, part of what I miss is doing church security and doing security consultant type stuff your church security group should have a standard right you shouldn't just arm a bunch of dudes at your church you should let people be armed at your church i fully believe that if they're going to serve under the authority of the church right if they're going to serve as being employed you know probably voluntarily but being employed that kind of makes the organization liable you should have a standard for that church security group. You may make a base standard. When I was the commander of a tactical team, not only did we have our own proprietary qual, which was much harder, but the guys also had to shoot and pass the FBI qualification, the U.S. Army qualification, and that jurisdiction's police department qualification on top of our qualification. You may want to have your church security team, assuming they're, let's say they're only armed with handguns, which I don't think is the best strategy for church security, but let's say that that's where you're going to start. Then maybe they all have to pass, again, the FBI qual, because everybody knows it, not because it's the best qual, because if they go to court and a little old lady is on the jury, she's probably going to know about the FBI and know who they are and think, whether it's false or correct, that they are competent gunfighters. They're competent with firearms, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's why you might have that. You may want to go beyond that for your own proprietary qual. Easy example of church security. Let's say that from the, you know, the front main doors of your church where almost everybody comes in to the pulpit is 36 yards. And I'm just making this up, right? Then you probably want to have a 36 yard stage in your qual, right? If you're in a church with a bunch of people running and screaming, if an event happens or people everywhere, even though, let's say, the FBI qual says you can miss the entire silhouette target 20% of the times and still pass, you might want a little bit better standard than that, right? Because you've got innocent people everywhere. And, you know, and there is a difference between hitting a target at 25 yards and hitting it at 36 yards. If you've got a 36-yard shot in your church and you have a security guy that's at the front doors and he may have to take a shot to the pulpit, somebody's gotten up there and is doing something that needs to be stopped and their behavior needs to be changed right now, they ought to be able to make a 36-yard shot. Maybe use that as part of your strategy, like your best shooter that can, even on his worst day, competently, almost always, again, nothing is certain, but almost always make a 36-yard handgun shot. Maybe that's the guy you want at the front doors that can see the entirety of the area. 
maybe your less good shooters you want to put at the halfway point so the farthest shot they ever have to make is 20 yards right and i know that's not half so super nerdy math nerd about it anyway i'm just throwing this out there you should have a standard if you're going to have a church security group that being said you heard my bio i was as a private contractor and working in the civilian side for quite a while paid a very good deal of money to come up with security plans for events and for properties like multi-million dollar properties all the time routinely i will gladly do that and help out you and your church security team if you were in charge of one for free i will gladly do that for free pro bono it's just you sending me plans via email and me looking at them and giving you plans and standards i will certainly do that for free now if you want me to like fly somewhere or something like that you know you shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain you want to cover my cost to do that but if you just want to say hey here's my church here's the layout here's the blueprints here's how many people i have can you help me i will certainly help you for free on that right if it's a church or a synagogue right either one of those if it's a business or you're doing something like that, I do offer security consulting. I don't often mention it, but it is on the website, goodshepherdtraining.com. But anyway, if you're in charge of your church security team or you know the guy that is and you want them to reach out for help, again, if it's a church and you want me to consult via email, via looking at blueprints and knowing your team and coming up with a standard, I can certainly help with that. And you can contact me goodshepherdtraining.com with that I hope that you'll consider having a standard the next time you go to the range unless you're going to just have fun and take kids or take somebody out and teach them to shoot that's fine there's a place for that there's also a place to just go out and have fun and shoot you literally just want to go set out some tin cans on a log and shoot them in a safe manner have at it that's great Great American pastime, right? Shooting cans off a log with your AR-15 or with your Glock or whatever you want, right? Just just for fun. There's a time and a place for that. But if you're talking about being a gunfighter, this is gunfighter life after all. This is not plinking podcast. There's a place for that and it's a lot of fun. But have a standard, right? You should have an individual standard. I believe that is better and stricter than your group standard. If you are part of a group, there should be a group standard, whether it's a sur- hardcore survivalist, you know, mag, that's a new buzzword, tribe, whatever. Whether it's a church security team, whether it's you as an individual, have a standard, have a plan when you go to the range. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Another way I've heard it said, Don't waste a rep. Don't get garbage reps. Just like reps at the gym, reps in gunfighting. If you missed, did you learn anything from it? Because if not, you just literally wasted and maybe became worse. You can go to the range and shoot 250 rounds and be worse than when you went. Because if you're reinforcing a bad habit, it's going to take that much more to overcome it. If you miss, that's fine. Evaluate, figure out why you missed and correct it. Misses are beneficial if you learn from them. When I pray... Yeah, and yes, I pray when shooting. Pray without ceasing, right? Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The Lord is a man of war. Exodus 15. The Lord is a man of war. I am made in his image. I don't apologize for being a warrior, and you shouldn't either. Anyway, I pray. I started this. I pray when I shoot. Pray when I work out. And you can take this prayer and use it. I pray for accuracy, speed, and consistency, and self-diagnostic ability. Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. Anyway, with that, men, I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Gunfighter Life. If you want to see videos of me shooting, I've been posting several videos a week for the patrons. And I'll tell you what, I will post, I will make one of those public after this, by God's grace. I will go and make one public. The majority of them will still stay for patrons, and they've had the videos for a while. I think I've done four last week and four this week. By God's grace, I'll continue to do more. 
on shooting and shooting drills and different skills. But I'll put one on there for the entire audience. So if you want to, again, the easiest way, just go to goodshepherdtraining.com. There's a Patreon link on there. Just click it and scroll down. A lot of those will be hidden because they'll be for the patrons. If you want to become a patron, great. You know, if not, enjoy the free content. But I'll put at least one of the shooting drills on there so you can see it. Maybe you want to take a similar drill and make it part of your standard. Maybe not. Maybe you just want to see I actually know how to shoot. That's probably a good thing if you're listening to this podcast and taking advice, right? I should probably know how to shoot. That's why I put the bio in all the things that God has blessed me to do because I wouldn't draw one breath, let alone making it through Iraq and some of the nastiest streets in the country if God didn't protect me and have grace on me and give me the talent and skills and discipline to do it. But I put the bio in every show so you, again, not just listening to some guy with opinions that aren't based on anything. Anyway, with that, thanks for listening. Tactical tip of the day, malfunctions. A lot of groups neglect this. Even a lot of agencies neglect this. Maybe this is aside from your actual shooting qualification, but maybe you have a mutual assistance group or maybe you have a church security group, right? You should. I had this when I was the commander of a tactical team. I set this standard in place. It would have to demonstrate to me the ability to clear malfunctions. Dry fire in a safe environment with no live ammo present. With snap caps, you set up malfunctions and have them clear them. So you can do this for yourself, right? This should be part of practice. Practice the manipulations to clear a failure to fire, to clear a double feed. You may also, as part of a church security group, part of a mag, part of your agency, if you're in charge of training, okay, our standard is going to be fix a failure to fire in two seconds. Our our standard is going to be to fix a double feed in two seconds three and a half seconds well i'm just throwing those numbers out there whatever it is right that should be part of the standard because guns malfunction yes even glocks malfunction they all malfunction ars ars get a ton of malfunctions ars have a lot of times taken an ar like professional class from a good organization a big chunk maybe 25 or more percent of that class will be spent on fixing malfunctions you know why because they malfunction all the time talking about a mag or being armed with ARs, then that's an even bigger part, right? You can even get triple feeds in ARs. So how do you fix a triple feed? You should probably know how to do that. Failure to extracts are pretty common. How do you fix that? And you should have a time standard to fix that on the clock. Anyway, that's your tactical tip of the day. Fix your malfunctions. Have a standard for that as well in an organization and at least know how to do it if you're practicing with yourself with that men i was reading my bible this morning and the entire chain of thought by the holy spirit that came to this to be this episode came from this scripture so i will read it you shall not have in your bag differing weights a heavy and a light you shall not have in your house differing measures a large and a small You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving you.